Thank you so much for listening to this podcast, guys. Um, I have recently just been getting so much joy out of engaging with our Patreons because, frankly, it has really become a Patreon community. Um, And I just wanted to sincerely express gratitude and also to throw in a trigger warning. Yes, people, my dad does work uh, in psychology and he sees... Uh, clients, etc. The business can go to some of the sordid and most dark places uh, that a person can go. So this is a trigger warning. Not that we get super in depth or in detail, but there's just references and stuff that honestly might upset you or just might not be your vibe. Are you maybe you're on your way to Subway to get a flatitza and you don't want to hear that shit, right? I don't know your life, but this is a trigger warning. You've been warned and I hope you guys enjoy the app. Hi, everybody. Welcome to a very special episode of My The Asshole Podcast. I'm joined today by an incredibly special guest. He is a doctor of psychology. He is a very bald man, a pickleball fanatic. He is my father, Dr. Vega. Welcome to the show. Well, happy to be here. It's good. It's good that we're here. We tried to do this over Zoom, and it was a technological Kafkaesque nightmare. Kafkaesque. I like that word. At what point you said, I don't know where the window is. I lost the window. <laughs> you had lost me. Oh, yeah. This is true. I did lose you. But that happens when I do Zoom. I, I don't know how Computers to do Computers are hard for you. But I've told people you're not computer illiterate by any stretch. You've done programming. You're very good with a computer. It's just new. Yeah, 30 years ago. 30 years ago. It's, do you feel that new technology, it's confusing for you? Well, of course. I think it's more confusing than it was. By, I mean, you get used to what you're used to. And right, then, right. You know. Well, it's good to have you here. Now, uh, one thing that I think has come up a lot on the pod, and this is a part of our culture now, is psychobabble. You've, you've urged me not to use psychobabble. Now, every, everybody's a narcissist. Everyone has, quote, unquote, trauma. These terms have kind of seeped their way into the popular consciousness. But well, but you tell me, you say, Danny, don't you, if you're in a conflict, don't ever use psychobabble. Well, why? Well, because a lot of people do it in order to, um, uh, I don't know, in order to really to avoid the actual issue itself. Uh, a lot of times they will, rather than refer to what happened, the, the way the conflict came about, uh, they'll say, well, she's bipolar. Sure. And so, and they continue to make reference to the person's bipolarity, and uh, and use it as a as an excuse to to say I'm I'm out of the relationship or she's intolerable I can't handle her or him and uh, and and it, and it doesn't uh, bring about good communication at all. Right. Right. You know, it's more like a character assassination type of deal. It's reductive. And yes. it's abstract also. You're not saying the concrete details of what happened. Right. I mean, what does that mean? Even the diagnosis of bipolar disorder is different for different people. Sure, so, sure. You know, um, when you look at a diagnostic criteria, you know, it's not every, every one of the criteria applies to that person. Only a certain number of the criteria apply. And so it's, uh, it's absolutely, what's the word I want to use? It just, it's not productive. It's yeah, not productive. Yeah. It's not, uh, it doesn't communicate. It, it doesn't translate to, to uh, a good communication at all. You don't do therapy, though. This is interesting. You're a clinical psychologist. Right now, I'm more of a forensic psychologist than a clinical, um, but I don't do therapy. Uh, I used to do a lot of therapeutic evaluations, sure. which is the jobs of uh, a clinical psychologist. And uh, lately, I've been doing a lot of court work, a lot of uh, you know child protective services, uh, a lot of competency evals through the courts. A lot right. Of That's what you're saying if someone mm-hmm. is competent or not to stand trial. Right. For example, that would be it. Or, you, you know, or uh, with the uh, uh, DCS or CPS, child protective ser- services, it'll be competent to, par- are you competent to parents? Right. What are your deficits? And then with like voc rehab, you know, um, what are your, uh, you know, intellectual capacity, academic capacity, right. uh, adaptive capacity in, uh, in order for you to um, obtain employment? Now, when I used to transcribe your vowels, I would write down what you were saying because you dictate. That's just your workflow. Right. One pattern I picked up was a lot of people, it's not that they're bad parents per se, it's that they're not ready to stop partying. Are you on board for this? This is a common... Well, I mean, if you can't stop partying, you, you're 
pretty bad parent. Well, it translates that <laughs> I mean, way, but he, it's uh, yeah, you know, yeah. You're right. You're right. You can't separate. The but are two. you agree? Do you agree that that's well, a pattern I mean, you if see? What you're talking about is well, I think what you're referring to is ultimately. Um, the use of drugs and alcohol, right. and that goes with the partying. Right. And that's a major problem with uh, maltreatment, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I would say that that's um, more common than not uh, with, with the cases that I have, yes, ab absolutely. Yeah. And so if you want to put it that way, I mean, you, you, you focus more on the party end. I'm more focused on the substance use end. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that's how people party. Exactly. So we're, we're basically talking about the same sure. kinds of things. Yeah. So the other thing that you've always stressed to me, and I think this comes up a lot, because, you know, we'll, we'll be looking at this am I the asshole situation, and uh, there's something, it's a story that this person is telling us or telling the Internet, and they're, they're sort of like, hey, this happened. And sometimes we do, we try to avoid it, but we'll, we'll, we'll read into it. You know, we'll view it as a projection of sorts. But I guess the way I tie this into you is you always stress to me the importance of the holistic picture. You know, for instance, you give a test called the human figure drawing test. And one of the interesting things that, that always stuck with me is that if a child is has some kinds of issues, I think, you know, issues with closeness or whatever, they'll draw vapid eyes. So they'll draw big big circles for eyes. What happens is with these with children and human figure, it's very interesting because when kids are very small or very young, uh, they tend to draw, for example, a four-year-old will draw a really big head. Yeah. And uh, then the arms, and then they'll all draw the arms and the legs. And essentially, they're recapitulating their development, you know, because their head is the first thing that develops. Right, so the younger it feels you like are, we live in our head. Right. The yeah. younger you are, you know, if you get a three-year-old to draw a human figure drawing or maybe a two-and-a-half-year-old, they may just draw a big circle. Really? Yeah. That's and interesting. May, may, yeah, just may just a be circle? Like, yeah. May just draw a circle. And, um, and, and basically, it just kind of... Um, a, a recapitulation of, of their own development. And right. so, and, and then they go seeing the, is so primary and your eyes are in your head. Is that, am I reading that right? Well, you, you what do you mean your eyes? Why well, isn't that part of it? That's why well, yeah, we, so yeah. I, you feel like, like I feel like I'm in my head is arbitrary, right? I mean, I'm just as right. much in my fingertips, yeah. but I feel like I'm right. in my head because that's vision right. is my kind of primary. Right. And then you see it also as they get a little older, you see the gross motor first, which is the arms. They really don't pay attention to the details of the fingers, which right. would be more, yeah. They're just aware they have arms. But, but what I, where I was going with this is that it's the holistic picture, right? So yes, there are interesting correlations and relationships, but in the end, it's not any one indicator on any one test. It's not any one test score. It's the whole thing, the interview, the battery of tests, all of this adds up to a meaningful evaluation, not just one thing. That is correct. Uh, however, with projectives, um, a lot of times what you have is, and I, and I guess you could, you could always argue this as, um, well, you know, you got lucky or, uh, you know. But sometimes there are certain things that people draw, uh, that people say, uh, which essentially tells the whole story. And sometimes so it's, it's like just, the opposite of the holistic picture. Yeah, exactly. Really? The opposite. Yeah, yeah, there's situations I feel that work this way. There's one sentence where we go, I don't like that. That's something, there's something there. Well, I had a case of a woman who had molested her son. It was a horrible molest case. She had um, placed a knife under the bed, uh, and it was it's just very horrible. And the, and the child was around 10 and gave very, uh, very vivid description of the whole thing. Yeah. And um, that this had occurred, there was just no, no doubt about it. And this woman, uh, as I interviewed her, one of the things that I did was I, um, I sat her down, we, we sat down, and I said, I want to read to you what your son said and um, proceeded to read to her uh, the details of what her son had described and I mean ho horrific I mean, if sure. you, if you, I mean even I as I was reading them was just like yeah. oh my god my stomach spare and, us the details and please, there was yeah. no there was really no emotion at all she did express no emotion at all um, if she had not done it I mean she one would expect that she would go ballistic on so how sure. in the world could he make, say such a horrible things. Right, right. Uh, or, yeah. uh, however, she was neutral. She was completely neutral. She didn't say a word. And at the end, she said, 
I didn't do this, and I'll take it to the grave with me. Oh, my God. So oh my God, that, that phrase, makes no sense. Yeah, sorry. So that <laughs> phrase told it all. <laughs> You're going to take what to the grave? If you didn't do it, there's nothing to take. There's nothing to take to the grave. <laughs> wow. So sometimes people tell you exactly what the truth is by supposedly telling you that, you know, denying what Well, they that is do. one of your juicy quotes. You told me people can't lie. They can't in a lie. Sense. They essentially, eventually you will get it either, either through their words through their emotions, through their sure. affect, sure. Uh, and they, they, cannot, they cannot lie. I think another interesting thing you've often told me, which is there are no random thoughts, you know, which I, I, think, I, I think there are thoughts that probably aren't that meaningful, but it's always worth, I, I mean, I think that inspires a lot of introspection to look at your mind that way and go, well, why would I have this thought? Why am I having this feeling? It kind of begs. Exactly. Uh, yeah, random. There, there are no random thoughts. And of course, one of the tests that I give and I have been giving for many years is called the sentence completion test. Right. And so, you know, you start a sentence and sure. then you're supposed to end it uh, in a way that represents your real feelings, you know. Right. Uh, so if the sentence could be something like, I like, and then you, you have to finish the Just sentence. Just that simple. Right. It's, it's like a hinge set. prompt, everybody. Go ahead. A hinge prompt? That's a dating app. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so, you know, so in other words, we're going to be looking at what that person says. And there's a number of items, obviously like 40 items, 40 stems, sen sentence stems. Yeah. And so the, there are no correct answers. I mean, right. the answers are completely... That's a projective test. You're yes, just kind that of is a boring. projective test. You're just supposed to finish the sentence to express your real feelings. And then in doing so, it's uh, it's a very you know it's a very for me it's an extremely productive test uh, that I use in conjunction with the objective tests, right. which are like the MMPI right. two. And so when sometimes you you don't get anything from an objective test, right? Um, or you you may get a lot of guardedness, or denial, etc. Or very little, or ver or very little of anything. Right. It can happen. Um, what are the, some of the, the gotchas, though, on the sentence completion test? Do you know any offhand that you've, you've read Well, this? yeah, like, there are some. I like blood, I think, would be a bad indicator of sorts or some, something like that, right? Right, or what they don't say. You know, if, hmm. they're, if they're being given the sentence completion test and they're in the midst of a custody situation. They could have their kid take you, it. You're going to have, you're going to have X number of items that are, make reference to their children. How you know you either think. They, they miss their children or they're sure. so sorry they did what they did to their children. And sometimes they don't say anything at all or mm. sometimes they overdo it. And so, uh, you know, you just again, you, this is just one piece right. of the puzzle. Uh, and it can be uh, very, uh, like I said, very uh, productive as far as diagnostically, uh, you know, letting me know the areas of concern. Very interesting. All right, now let's get on. Let's go on to a lighter note here. I'm just curious. You are a pickleballer, and and for the listeners who don't know, pickleball, I would describe it as tennis, but with a wiffle ball. And I'll let you describe it better than I. you're better. You're much better at describing things than me. I think that's pretty you're, fair. Yeah, that's well, pretty you, fair. you probably the say smaller it's, court. it's more sophisticated than tennis. It's a, it's well, the most no, beautiful I mean, game. It's very. You know, it does have very uh, similarities. To, Similar. To, you got to get close to the net. That sure, kind of for all outward appearances. But what I'm curious to you is there have been some kerfuffles here. You live in what I would describe as an old folks community. Yes, um, I do. Old farts, as I call them, yeah. Hey, you said it, not me. And you guys play pickleball. You're all adults. You're all older adults, and yet there's still conflict. There's still... Uh, what, what? Who are the assholes at the pickleball court, and what are they doing? It's incredible. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> You know, I was talking to a colleague of mine, and um, we all are familiar with the concept of uh, it's as you get older, um, the more so. It's called the more so. <laughs> the more so. The more so. Yeah, the more so you are, the way you used to be. It's except worse. Oh no! <laughs> if you have a particular personality style okay. that, that you know that uh, doesn't please other people, there's going to be more of it as you get older. Oh no! Yeah, so you end up in situations that seem so um, 
incredibly puerile or you know adolescentish, if sure. you will. Yeah. You go back to being kids again. Oh uh, yeah, it's even sometimes and sometimes worse. Not all, but there's a uh, there's a number that they, they seem to have nothing better to do. Sure. And they uh, you know and then it becomes everything. And they take it so serious. You're not one of those individuals? No, no. I mean, I, I'm competitive. I love it. I only take it out on myself. I would never take it out on anyone else. You're a good else. teammate. I can confirm that, actually. You're a very good teammate. Yeah. Supportive. But we do yell. Vegas yell. We're, we are yellers oh, yeah. on the court. Yeah. We're pissed off. No, I'm pissed off, but all, up. always at myself. At yourself. It will always be Absolutely. at myself. Absolutely. You know, if I'm, if I'm upset at your, at your play, I, I may say something, you know, under my breath, but right. But I would never, no. You're pretty good about it, got to admit. Well, that's good. All right. Look, let's go. Let's do tell one story. I want you to tell the quick version of the story, but you do have a classic story. Every dad has a classic story or 10, and then that's the only thing they ever tell. But this is a long one, So, but, but try to cut it down a little bit it for us this is when you were capsized at sea so let's let's get into it you were a young man yes uh, there were some um, yeah i was 18 years old just graduated from high school in miami in miami florida you're a miami cuban and uh my cousin uh fausti who was uh 21 maybe at the time a um friend the bear who has since passed away and uh he was also 21. El Oso, because it was Spanish. El Oso, yeah, El yeah. Oso. The bear sounds a little weird in English. It yeah. sounds like no, a different Well, we thing. called him the bear in English. Oh, you did? Yeah, we did. Oh, yeah, the bear, we called him also and the bear. Got it. Yeah, bilingual people do that. Got it. <laughs> and then there was Pepe. Now, Pepe was considerably older. He was in his uh, early 30s, and he already had a PhD in physics, so he was a brainiac. The four of us... We went, um, you know, we went on a uh, out boating. You know, the we went fishing. Out Actually, we went we went fishing, nineteen foot outboard or inboard. I don't know. I don't know anything about boats, and that's part of the problem. This is like a Saturday in the summer. Yeah, in it was Miami. like a Saturday in the summer in Miami. And what year estimate? Uh, nineteen seventy-three, August twenty-seventh. Oh wow! So we got this down. Got it. Yeah. And it was before Jaws. Jaws came this out. This is in, before Jaws. Yeah. Oh, what a key! Jaws came out in nineteen seventy-five. Thank God. So we went out around 10 miles, so we basically couldn't see land or very little of it. And, um, you know, we were, we were stupid. We were taking in water, and we thought it was funny because the fish that we were catching were swimming inside the boat. Right. And so eventually, when we turned on the motor, the, the boat went under, and the backside of the boat went kind of under, and all the water, you know, the water went towards the back, and we capsized. And so the we boat had, flipped, in other words. In other words, it flipped. But it was still floating. Yeah, on the, well, when it on flips. On the wrong side. Yeah, you know, it was Got going it. upside down. And I noticed that it was red at the bottom, which is interesting. And it turns out there may, there may have been a reason for that, which is mm -hmm. you can spot it from the air. And uh, so the four of us ba basically ended up on the bottom of the boat that was floating right. on the top. Right. You know? And so we drifted for about 10 miles. You know, we, we drifted for, for several miles, and, uh, you know, when we, when we capsized, Pepe, who was, uh, you know, who was involved in uh, anti-revolutionary activities against uh, Fidel Castro at the time, sure, he uh, was not very stable mentally also, I, I think, right. you, you know, and he was going nuts thinking that we were going to drift into Cuban waters and that we were going to be, a, yeah. That's too far, right? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, 90 uh, miles we away. We weren't even close to Cuban waters, we were only 10 miles, even though Cuba is 90 miles. Yeah, yeah, yeah but come on, you're not going to drift not, that far. You can never drift that far. And so, and so he, that was one of the, one of the things that he was talking about. <laughs> then the other thing he started talking about was, let's yeah. swim, let's swim to shore, we can make right. it. Right. And, and just, he's the older one, so this, is this kind of weighing on everyone? Because you guys are young compared to him, so you're kind of like, damn, Pepe Yeah, is but old. you know, we all knew he was kind of quirky, okay. and so even okay. though he's a brainiac, and you know, he's also a dorky kind of guy, yeah. um, and nerdy, and so, you know, we, yeah, we, we listened, but in this case, when he said, let's, um, let's swim, it just so happens that about a couple of weeks before this incident, I was watching TV, and there was a public announcement. Sure. And on TV, and on and on TV, it came on. If you're ever, you, you would think, you know, you, you know, this is kind of miraculous. Absolutely. And uh, and the announcement was, if you're if you ever capsize in the middle of the ocean, right, stay with the boat. 
This is unbelievable. Stay with the boat, yeah. And, uh, and, and I happened to have seen that. And when we capsized and we were talking about, well, what are we going to do? Pepe, you know, I told Pepe, no. And, and the rest, I said, no, we're not doing that. We are staying with the boat because I saw this public announcement and we're staying with the boat. And everyone was with you. And everyone was with me. There, there was no more discussion about that. So um, it was amazing. And so, you know, the, one of the experiences I had, or a couple of things, I always, uh, you know, I, I was always a little envious of my cousin, uh, Fausti, because he, uh, he, te he tested very well and ended up at Harvard. Right. And I always thought I was smarter than he was. And um, I think I may still be just as smart, but you sound like me. This this is clearly yeah. genetic because I'm the but same I, way. But I don't have. I mean, I don't have one fiftieth of the memory this guy has, or the prestige, or well, no, he, the memory did it. I mean, the, well, he has Harvard, and you have well, uh, you know. yeah, yeah, no, no, no. But I'm saying <laughs> I was a little envious because because I, you know, I, you know, I once I realized that he has a prodigious, prodigious uh, memory, right. I didn't feel so bad. I said, well, I, at least I can attribute it to the memory and not Right, the, right. And he does. He has an incredible, incredible memory. And I was a little bit, you know, envious. I mean, we were, when we were in the middle of the ocean and we turned around, um, I have to tell you that that little thing that I had for Fausti, that may be a little envy of the sure, memory, sure. went away completely right. because... I've never seen someone suffer so much as, as he did. And what he did was he started to remember things from the past. Right. And he would talk to me. He says, do you remember when we did this? And when your sister and I, when my sister and I, and then he would go on and on. And it was torturous. I mean, he was tormented. So that was one. <laughs> one is I go, you know, I guess you know, God was good to me in a way, you know. Um, it's not always good to have such a good memory. And then... Um, you know, the other thing that I learned was I learned about being suicidal. Yeah. Uh, and it, it helped me in my career later. I became suicidal at one point, uh, probably at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning when, mm -hmm. when I thought for sure this is, we're going to die out here. Yeah. So I it's started pitch blackout. Right. I started contemplating it. And I was hallucinating also. Uh, you saw a water skier. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I said, you know, I, I, I thought about killing myself and how I would do it. I was going to jump into water and swallow it. Um, and I connected it to the fact that um, there was a feeling of hopelessness. Of course. Yeah. And I, and I think that research now shows that, in fact, the variable hopelessness is huge when it comes to suicidality. So I learned that as well. And so to end the story of the boat that I think is... Well, hold on. I got a detail. Oh, okay. I think you're going to skip over it. People, I need you to understand, let's keep in mind, Fausti has much better memory than my father. And Fausti claims that you suggested that everyone should drink each other's urine. That was a thing that you deny, if I recall. Yeah, I, I deny that. I don't recall it that way. But who has the memory? Anyway, well, so he go does on. have the memory, though. But he's in shock also. Yes. There's a lot of shock, you know. I mean, look, it's not that crazy of a thing to think. It's like your body discarded nutrients, but maybe no, it someone did come else's up. body. It did come up, but it wasn't my idea. It wasn't your it idea. It was Pepe's idea. Okay. It was Pepe. It was not my idea. Okay. I, but he's right. So, it did so come up. it came up. We did talk about it and because Pepe had military experience. Sure. And so sure. it was okay. his. Let's move on. So you're on the boat. It's 3 a.m., 4 a.m. The sun comes up. The sun comes up. And then morning seems to last forever. Yeah. And then um, it was around 10 o'clock when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, seemed to be out of nowhere, there's this Coast Guard helicopter. Yeah. Just went right on top of our heads. Was there a moment where you're like, this isn't real? I, no, I don't think there was a moment like that. I mean, it was, it was, it was like, this is, wow, this is. Uh, wow. Yeah. What and, a uh, and then when they finally, not only when they went over our heads, but then when they came back. Yeah. Uh, then that's where the orgasm takes place, which is right. the kind that you will never have. Well, you just said it was better than any orgasm. Any, any, any orgasm I've ever had. Ever, no, yeah. Yeah, I've never had an orgasm like that. I mean, this. This was beyond orgasmic. Yes. Okay. It's, it's just a flow of endorphins that, is, Got it. that must be unbelievable. So, uh, <laughs> so it, what makes the story even more interesting at the end of it all was when they rescued us. Yeah. So then they dropped like a rope ladder down? Yeah. They, a rope ladder is exactly what they did. Wow. And then they brought us into the helicopter. So you had to climb the rope ladder. 
Yes. We climbed the Was that scary at all? No. No, it wasn't scary. No, well, we got the hell. I, nothing was scary at that point. Everyone right. was like, well, this is great. You know, we're getting the hell out of here, you know? Yeah. And then, of course, we had the famous um, drink. Uh, the, what's it? The um, root beer. You the were root handed beer. a root beer. We were, My dad has told this story to me so many times, guys. I know it better than him. That's he just, does know it better than I do, yeah. Um, and so, yeah. And so then it was one root beer for the four of us. And there's a reason why they did that, too. Why is that? Because they don't want you to drink too much. Right. Because that'll backfire. And we never, I never drank root beer. I never particularly liked it. But since then, I've always had an incredibly great association to A root soft beer. spot for it, yeah. Yeah, anytime I have it, it, it brings. Anytime I hear a helicopter, you know, it's also kind of a very pleasant feeling. I would like that because the helicopters piss me off. They're yeah. so loud. But, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because I, you know, I'm also a Vietnam era type of guy. I, mean, I didn't go to Vietnam, but I'm, you right. know, I miss Vietnam by one year. Um, but, you know, a lot of Vietnam vets, the helicopters, you know, trigger them into post-traumatic stuff, you know. Sure, sure. And for me, it's the exact opposite. So it's kind of ironic. So anyway, they brought us into Marathon. I'll never forget Marathon Key. And um, they asked us to come in to talk to the captain or whatever. And so we went in. And we, we didn't know why. And the captain showed us that in the, in the wall behind him, he had a giant map. And he had two X's and a line between the two X's. And he says, look, over here is where we found you. This other X is where we think um, you capsized. Sure. We estimated that you've uh, been drifting for about, I don't know, 10 miles, whatever it was. Sure. They said, okay, so. He says, well, from midnight until 2 o'clock in the morning... You were in three feet of water. Wow. Yeah. And so that was uh, so an amazing... So you could have just gotten out of the boat. Yeah, we could have gotten out of the boat. Wow. That's correct. Well, it's a classic story, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. That was probably my 55th uh, revisiting of it. <laughs> and it probably won't be my last. Um, we're just going to... We're going to do a situation here. Let's, let's do this thing. AITA for wanting my daughter's boyfriend slash soon-to-be fiancé to know her dark secret before marriage. I'm the dad of a 25-year-old young woman who I love very much. I've been able to have a good relationship with my daughter, and I enjoy my time with her. But there's one thing about her, there's one thing about her that uh, would give many people pause. She's a diagnosed sociopath. She exhibited odd, disturbing behavior at a young age, and after a serious incident of abuse toward her younger sister, I realized she needed professional help. Throughout her elementary years, she struggled heavily, getting in lots of trouble in school for lying, cruelty, and all other types of misbehavior. With an enormous amount of therapy and support, her bad behavior was minimized as she grew older. She received an ASPD diagnosis at 18, and I had suspected it for long prior. ASPD? Antisocial personality disorder. There we go. After her aggressive behavior was tamed her following years were fruitful she's law-abiding has a decent job good education many good friendships admirers especially male admirers she is very very charming and adept at attracting guys and maintaining their interest she uses that old dating guide the rules like a bible i'm not familiar with the rules you ever heard of the rules she currently has a boyfriend of about a year and a half who's crazy about her and who I have a very strong relationship with. We live in the same area. We spend time together regularly. He's a great guy, kind, funny, intelligent, but I doubt that she loves him. We've had some very honest, in-depth discussions about her mental health since her diagnosis, and she's been open with me that she doesn't feel love or empathy toward anyone, even family. When she acted very sad and broken up over the death of one of her closest friends at the funeral, she confessed to me privately that it was all a put-on and that she felt, quote-unquote, pretty neutral about the whole thing. She's also stated that she has never once felt guilty about anything she's ever done and doesn't know what guilt feels like. While she enjoys being around her boyfriend and is sexually attracted to him, I highly doubt she feels much of anything toward him love-wise. Her boyfriend, who might propose soon, has no idea about her diagnosis, and she's been very upfront with me that she has no plans to ever tell him, thinking it'll scare him away. I've made it clear to her that she needs to tell him the truth before they marry, that he has the right to know and consider it, or I will. 
To which she always responds, I know you wouldn't dare. I actually would. I like and respect this young man and would feel awful keeping this quote unquote secret from him and letting him walk into a marriage without this piece of knowledge. I'm not trying to sabotage my daughter's future. Maybe her boyfriend's love of her personality and other aspects is enough that it won't end the relationship. It's his decision to make, but he deserves all the facts. Someday he's bound to find out she's a bit quote unquote off. It can't be kept a secret forever. A-I-T-A. Well, I guess okay. I would start this. You you seem quiet for a second yeah, here, so I'm, I'm I'm thinking about it. Well, about one principle you always and this is at odds with this, right? Is that the parent should always have the best interests of the child at heart, you know? And I think this is a real in between a real rock and a hard place. Well, I mean, there's 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 okay. He has this concern. She has this disorder. Um, the the fact of the matter is that it. You know, one of the things that he could do uh, in order to mitigate this and uh, not to just completely betray her confidence is um, to let her know that she needs to, you know, she needs to make him aware of her of, of, of her full background. Yeah. And um, and of course, at that point, uh, you know, see whether she will do that or not. She's not, because right. he did so that. So he did that, okay. So then I would say to him, just look, what I would do is I will tell him that he, you know, if, if she in fact doesn't, then I am concerned, I would tell him, you know, you need to know from her what her, you know, what her background, her medical history is. Her full medical and so Adam, and you biomedical. wouldn't say he's not going to spill the beans. He's, he's gonna not going to spill the beans. There's beans. But there's, I'm not going to spill them. But exactly. There are beans. But I'm going to put the responsibility back on her, uh, on uh, on her saying it. And I think I would do my part by warning him and says, sure. "Look, there is a lot there, you know." And of course, the other thing is that if he asks him, in other words, if the guy then turns around and says, "Well, what do you mean? What history?" You know, then I'm not telling him. He's asking me. You're and then at that him. point, I would say to him, no, you ask oh, her, see. you know. And then if he doesn't get an answer from her, he can always come back and say, what are you talking about? She's not giving me this history. And then I would simply say, well, you need to know that history. And uh, I think at that <laughs> point, it'll, it will resolve itself. Um, uh, because he will, he will then know, and then if, at that point, then if he if he says, "Well, I can live without not knowing," then he the father hasn't betrayed her confidence. Oh, there's an option where he could just say, "Well, I'm fine. I acknowledge that there may be beans to spill, but precisely, I don't want to know." Precisely. Okay, well, I'm going to mount a little bit of a defense here. I would say you we we kind of opened this thing talking about how these disorders, etc., they're reductive. Fine, she's technically antisocial personality disorder. It's not manifesting in any real way. What does this really mean? It means she had a series of tendencies. She doesn't feel guilt. That's a little weird. I guess I would say the fact that he doesn't know that she doesn't feel guilt does strike me as odd. That, that's weird. How does that not come up? Well, it may not come up. I mean, I guess. you know. Good Lord, what kind of intimacy well, she can do you have? always feign it. But that, that, so yeah, that, well, because then, then it starts to shift into, is there a deception happening? And that, that is what I'm starting to feel because mm -hmm. uh, going around saying I have antisocial personality disorder, well, that's your right. If you don't want to tell people that, that's your right. But to not, to have an intimate relationship with someone where they're going to marry you and they don't know that you've never felt the emotion of guilt, that seems odd to me. That seems like there is an active suppression happening that's starting to push me more into where you're at okay so let's try this the other way maybe you're being too soft about things is that possible like is it is there something irresponsible about this if we kind of come for her and say well look she has this diagnosis and it appears that it's uh <clears throat> you know a big part of who she is she doesn't feel guilt ever she therefore must be actively hiding She's hiding this tremendous thing that is relevant, I would say, almost on a daily basis. I'm feeling guilt on a daily basis about something or other, you know. Well, I think... Then, that, then maybe he has a mandate well, to say something, look, to spill those beans, maybe. The other, the other thing is, what, what, what are we talking about here as far as what, you know, if, he's being, if this guy is being told 
that you, there are beings like you were, like you were mentioning this. You know, yes. you, you need to be aware of, of her background. You need to let her, if she hasn't told you, she needs to she needs to tell you. Okay? Yeah. Um, and he says, look, I don't I don't want to know. I mean, that's her right to know. I don't care what it is. Um, there's also the possibility that. Um, you know, antisocial personality disorders, for example, they do real well sometimes in prison. They <laughs> look great. They adjust to the now. Honey, I could be great if I go to prison. Yeah, no, they adjust to the now. They adjust to their environment. They, yeah. they completely adjust to their environment. So technically, if they're together, they're having a good love life, and they're working, and they're just carrying on their world, there may be nothing that comes up where that would really interfere in the relationship, even though they may have a pseudo type of closeness. Um, yeah, but know, I and, mean, good Lord. Well, I mean, and then it, it, he may be happy with it. Uh, is he unhappy? How does, how I is guess he? you're right. It's conceivable. It's conceivable. It's absolutely conceivable. But what about raising children when your mother? That's what I was saying. That's All where right, I was so getting to. Then we're, we're getting into the children. Now we're, now you up the ante. Because now we want to see what's going to be that person's response to, uh, to her, her children. And there's, again, the possibility that this may not apply to the kids. It right. may. That she could be a good mother, you're I, saying. Yeah. Because I have, I, have, I, have, uh, I have been involved with antisocial person. Well, you know, if you look at the mafia people, look at the people, you know, uh, you know the, 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 except for the Italian mafia. They kill, they maim, do whatever they do, but don't mess with my family. Right. We love our family. And, right. we're, and we're going to church and we're, you know, baptizing while we're killing I don't know how many people. But sure, sure. So, so there is that. So the, you could consider those people antisocial personality disorders. They may, they, they may be sociopathic to certain people, but not right. to others. So uh, the issue of uh, being a sociopath, you know, in this case, you, know, you made the case that this person doesn't have any feelings, so this is disconcerting, obviously. But do we know that maybe she could make an exception? Do we know whether, in fact, she may develop some feelings for him as opposed to, you know, anybody? The other issue is, what about therapy? What about if she says, hey, look, you know what? I'm going to try to get the therapy. Well, yes, but all this is, but yeah, but that takes place in a world where he knows, right? And he doesn't know. So I think really the question that we're trying to answer well, is would he be the asshole for telling her? Well, you propose a pseudo telling, right? He's going to tell her, tell this man that there's something to be told, but he's not going to actually tell her. There's something that, uh, exactly. That's, uh, that's what I propose. The other thing is for her to then say, well, uh, yes, there is something to be done. I don't want to say it, but I am going to address it in, in, in therapy. This is something I need to do on my own in therapy. She has that option, too. Big Rotten Tuna writes, this is absolutely the hardest one I've ever read. I think it's about Reddit's pay grade. OP, you should talk with a psychologist about it. Well, I'm doing that right now, baby. That's what somebody said on oh, Reddit oh, responding to the okay. post. I see. Smiley Dude writes, this is somewhat of a real example of the trolley problem. You can let the trolley run into him, or you can interfere and cause the trolley to run into her. Not interfering is the consensus agreement in a one-versus-one situation, especially when you can't know if the trolley is on track for him. But interfering will definitely turn the trolley toward her. I disagree. I, I think the trolley problem is not like this, because the trolley, uh, he doesn't have an intimate relationship with the trolley. So in my view, for him to not know shows me this relationship is already at, in a weird place with him. It seems inherently deceptive. And I would say the same about other disorders as well. Absolutely, I would. If it was anorexia and somebody had a, an extremely long history with anorexia and they were going to get married and the guy's like, oh, no, she's never had an eating disorder. I would be like, whoa, why doesn't he know about that? That seems like something that should have come up. It's not that she has a mandate to tell him, but it's like, what kind of relationship do you have? You're concealing, you're hiding things. Yeah, especially with loved ones around you. I mean, you know, you you, you don't live in a vacuum, so I see what you're saying. Um, but I think those things, uh, when they come up, um, uh, in 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 order to really um, maintain someone's confidence, et cetera, and respect that, there are things you can do. Uh, and that's basically what I'm alluding to. I'm alluding to the fact that there are there are still things that you can do, and that you can you know you can make 
things happen without actually yes. you yourself being the one that divulges well, it. Well, I like, I like your solution, but I think the question that I, I don't know if we agree here is if he does straight up spill the beans, right? Right. If he goes to this guy and just says, look, I'm going to just tell you what it is. Is he betraying her? Yes. But I think she's already betraying him. How are you going to tell me that you went to a funeral and felt nothing and your partner doesn't know? So what did you tell him? Did you tell him that you cried and that you cared and that you were sad that Abigail died? I think she is actively deceiving him already. And if they're going to get married, I think that's unfair. And so I would say that if he did tell the truth to this guy, he's fine. All right. But then you're, you're introducing another thing in here, and that is that um, lying to your uh, husband or lying to husband your husband to be. To sure. be sure. Uh, you know, how far do we go? I mean, this is, uh, you know. Uh, how far do you go to intervene? You know, and, you know, who are you to really say and intervene uh, as to s somebody lying? You know, and people are going to lie. Yes, you but know? if if she's actively deceiving him already, and I don't think there's any way out of that, right? He has a skewed perception of her that she is actively maintaining. That's an active deception. Okay. But how do you know that this is harming him? Well, I think that's inherently toxic. If, if, if she told him, I went to the funeral. How is it toxic to him? What evidence do you have? He lives in a false reality. He has a false relationship what with her. What evidence do you have that he is uh, disconcerted, that he is stressed? Well, he's unaware. He, he's blissfully unaware. So he's blissful. Well, fine. So, I'll give you that. So he's blissful. So, you know, I mean, what if this continues this way? I mean, who are you then to you know, uh, to interfere. You well, know, I'm so. the one who knows more, and I know right. that she's lying. Right, but... The um, father knows that she is that she is running active deception mm -hmm. on right. Look, I'm, I'm not saying that you shouldn't intervene uh, because there's concerns, well, but you, I think it yeah. needs to be at, at that level of, uh, you know, at the level of, you know, you guys need to talk. Yes. There's things that you need to well, talk I'm about. Well, I'm for your way, but what but the question is, would he be the asshole if he did spill the entire beans? I agree with you. I think your way is more measured and better, but I don't think he would be the asshole if he spilled the whole beans. I mean, even you offered a pretty clean loophole, right? Because you said that he could turn around and ask and go, what are the beans? And then he's going to tell. I mean, come on. What's really the difference? So if well, you, I would. Uh, no, wait a minute. I did, I, what I said was, if he said, "What are what are the beans?" Yeah, I would say, "Ask her what the beans." Ask her, are. but then if he but and then, then she, she refuses, she refuses, says, "Hey, you know, she's not telling me what the beans are, and I need to. I want to know what the beans right, are." Right, right, right. At that point, I say, "Hey, you know what? This is it. Then I'm going to tell you, because then that she's going too far." Right. Uh, and so uh, at that point, I, I think I would I would tell him. But uh, otherwise, I uh, you know you you still have to respect that. Um, you know, that, that relationship and, yeah. and maybe the guy doesn't want to know. I mean, I, I think that's a remote possibility. I don't know that anyone could hear that there's beans and then just be like, I don't care. Everybody wants the beans. Because ultimately you say she's lying to you. So uh, ultimately what you're saying is you're telling him she's lying to you. No, no, no. I agree with your method. I like your method. I think your method is a balanced method. I think, I don't think he would be the asshole if he just straight up spelled, spilled the beans. I think it would be worse if he did. I think I, I like what you're saying. And nonetheless, I, I think we agree. The question here is AITA for wanting my daughter's boyfriend to know her dark secret before marriage. And I think OP is not the asshole for that. In fact, that he should take active steps. There's a measured way that you propose. I'm on board for the measured way. So I think we're saying no assholes here. No assholes here. Here we go. AITA for saying that my boyfriend lacks the competence to call himself a psychologist. My boyfriend has a degree in accounting. He's 28. Ever since I met him, he's been passionate about giving dating advice to his friends and calls himself the modern day hitch. Hitch. That's a weird reference. He's always said that he wanted to write a book so he can help men get the girl of their dreams. Fast forward to now, he's written two books that he sells on Amazon. I don't know the names, and I haven't read them because he refuses to show me. He's also started taking clients and now calls himself a dating coach. We had a conversation about how he has a new client now, and I expressed my excitement for him. He then went on to talk about how crazy it is that people are not willing to invest money in their mental health, a statement to which I agreed. He continued by saying how he felt he was helping people improve their mental health and said that maybe he should call himself a dating psychologist. I, 
I laughed a bit and said he probably shouldn't do that because he doesn't have enough competence to call himself a psychologist. He immediately gets angry by my statement and asks me why I feel that way. I simply say that he hasn't read enough about the human mind and lacks knowledge in the field. He gets pissed and we have a whole argument about how negative I am and I'm trying to bring him down. Up until this point, I've always been supportive about his dating coach thing because it makes him happy. I simply made that statement because I do feel he should read more and gain more knowledge in the field before giving people the impression that he can help them with their mental health issues. Again, I think it's fine for him to call himself a dating coach, but I felt psychologist was pushing it. So am I the asshole? Yeah, absolutely. Well, for one, you can't, you can't just call yourself a psychologist. You can't put psychologist behind your name in any kind of way. Because? Dating or, because it's against the law. It's against the law. You know, even when I, before I could put, before I could say I was a psychologist, I had to, you know, I had to have a license or, you know, I had to have to, at the certification or no, it's right. licensing now. It's been licensing for many years, so he can't call himself a psychologist unless you have, you know, unless you pass the, the board exam. The license. board exam is what you yeah, pass. Yeah. It doesn't have a fancy name like the bar. It's just no, the board the, exam. The board of uh, uh, psychologist examiners. And so you know, I mean, that, that this one is a no. It's, it's a no-brainer. Now the, the problem with this is, you know. Therapy, counseling, coaching, you know, and then the research behind people that can be real helpful to other people, you know, and it, and it turns out that, that sometimes you don't need to have a, a, sure. a major degree, you know, years ago there was a study that were talking about English teachers versus psychiatrists, and the English teachers did a lot better. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah because ultimately, yeah, because ultimately when you, when you, the, the, the thing about therapy that's so crucial, and of course I'm not a therapist, right. so in a way I, uh, and there's a reason why I'm not a therapist, and, and uh, I think it'll become obvious when I tell you this, is that the rapport, the rapport that you build with that client, sure. the relationship is absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. But in order for that to happen, if you're not a psychopath, um, you get close to people. Yeah. You know, and it, it takes a chunk out of you. Right. When you're involved with the, the person's pain, the emotional pain, their story. Uh, and it can it can really be very um, disconcerting and, and hurtful. And that's why I don't do it. I, I don't think I can tolerate. I couldn't tolerate a caseload of 20 people. Um, all of all of whom had uh, trauma in their lives. Yeah, it weighs on you. It weighs on you. Yet I know that that relationship factor is the number one variable for success. You have to have that before you can have anything. So you can use any kind of technique you want to talk, talk about. We can talk about cognitive therapy. You can right. talk about. Well, therapist is not a protected term. Yeah, I think it is because there's also licensed therapists. What about counselors? Also licensed counselors, yeah. But coach, I guess, is easy. The coach, so you yeah, go coach. Right, yeah. So you're actually kind of a proponent of a coach. You know, maybe if you could find a coach for cheap, right, because you can't afford a therapist, you're saying that this person theoretically could be immensely beneficial. Well, I'm not a proponent of it. I'm okay. not a proponent of Too it. I'm just, I'm just telling you that... Uh, that if, there can be merits. If, if the person, yeah. If the person just says, says, hey, I'm a coach and has very good interpersonal skills. Yeah. There are people that have, are gifted that way and they can be helpful. Obviously, you, your chances are better if you could go to a professional that is licensed and trained and at the same time is also empathic. Sure, and, sure, sure. And can make that even better, you know? So you're, but I'm not a proponent of it, but to call himself a dating psychologist is ludicrous. Well, a lot of people actually want to go even farther than this and say that he is an asshole. And what is the crime that they have leveled? Mild underscore attitude writes, as others have said, there's probably going to be a lot of things in those books that are going to be an ugly shock to you about your relationship. Do you think you're the girl of his dreams or maybe he's been getting that dating experience he claims to have while the two of you have been together? I think it's a bit of a conspiracy theory. They're suggesting that uh, this guy is cheating, but it is pretty weird that he's a dating coach, writes these dating books and doesn't seem to share them with her. He refuses to show her the dating books. That's weird. Can she purchase them or get them? He won't tell, he won't tell her the name. He won't tell her. He won't show them to her. So he, she has no way to figure them out. He uses a pseudonym or something. Yeah, I mean, I think that that has fraud all over it. You know, I mean, you know, why not? I mean, what? The, well, why you fraud? Are, you go fraud? Or whatever. You know, uh, you know, he he's a fake. I mean, he's, he's a fake. Yeah, he's not. If he why why can't why can't he? If he's so proud of himself yeah. doing this, 
why would why what r- rationale does he give for right. doing that? Does he give a reason? Well, like now, he's, now he's trying to say that she's negative, so I think he's going to use that, right? Because he's saying I am a psychologist. Well, he's not a psychologist. He's not a psychologist. He's not a psychologist. Would you say that someone who calls himself a psychologist who is not is an asshole? I would say yes. Then I think we agree on this one, that this guy is probably up to no good. He's definitely not a psychologist. So we're saying, AITF, we're saying that my boyfriend lacks the competence to call himself a psychologist. We're saying not the asshole and the boyfriend is. Yes. Dr. Vega, thank you so much. Dad, thank you (laughs) for being on the show. You're an amazing guest, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Well, thank you very much.